Right. Isn't there a name for H2S? Yes. Yes, there. Someone said high school ice. Someone said high school ice. Hydrogen sulfide. How about the last one? Why is that now all of a sudden sulfuric acid? We get the sulfuric acid acronym because we have the AQ and we have the H in front. So that's our red flag that we're looking at and acid, right? Acids have particular chemistry that is so common and everywhere that we named them effectively first and we gave them their own special name so that we could call <laughs> attention to that reactivity. Okay. If we broke that down a little bit differently, this is where we're looking at some things. Okay. So for acids in particular, they noticed that when you tasted them and survived, uh, they were sour tasting. Right? And they also had this weird kind of sticky feeling with them. Okay? You've had acids ingested before already. You ever ate an orange? Yes. What is that kind of sticky, sometimes sour taste? Is citrus, and in particular, it is citric acid. Right? What? We're not talking. Nah, I'm not going to reiterate that. <clears throat> so we were able to note those classifications and that we noted that there were some acids that had larger effects than others. Okay? And we'll address that larger effect a little bit later on. Okay? We also noticed that there were some compounds that when we tasted them, they had a bitter taste and they had this slippery feel. So effectively opposites of each other. Okay? We also discovered that when I take these two different compounds, say a sour tasting, sticky feeling acetic acid, and I mixed it with a bitter tasting, slippery feeling sodium hydroxide, that we got a chemical reaction. Right? And that chemical reaction released a lot of heat. Right? So this helped me to kind of classify how those two things could react with each other. And on top of which, that the chemistry associated with the slippery feeling and say the sticky feeling were both kind of our skin dissolving. <laughs> <laughs> Not particularly pleasant, right? Okay, kind of gross. But when we mixed those two substances with each other, instead of ending up with this weird cross hybrid that just melted our bodies, we ended up with something that did nothing. Right? So we've now taken these highly dangerous compounds and we've neutralized them by mixing them with each other. Hence the birth of the neutralization reaction right? and that's what we're looking at here so our neutralization reaction is a double replacement right? and what it's referencing is the mixing of an acid with a base those two substances are opposites effectively cancel each other out and neutralize they lose their reactivity so we'll refer to that as a neutralization that's kind of the birth of our categories of acids and bases so as we now categorize them based off the sour taste, these kind of physical attributes, we pushed it a little bit further to try and come up with some kind of molecular attributes. Okay. One of the first definitions to come out was Arrhenius. And what he noticed is with these sticky acid compounds is that when they were added to water, they increased the presence of hydrogen ion. Okay. So he defined that substance, that sticky, sour tasting thing, as an acid and said what it did was increase the concentration of hydrogen ions. That was it. Right? So he's just inventing a word to represent what it's doing at a chemical level. When we go through and look at the slippery bitter tasting substances, he noticed that when those were added to water, noticed an increase in the concentration of hydroxide ions. Right? Those were the definitions he worked with. Okay. Those definitions are largely what you would work with through all of Gen Chem. Okay. And there are arguments that there are better definitions, and there absolutely are, and we'll look at some of that in a second. But for the most part, when you move through 151 and 152, what you're being asked to use is the Arrhenius definition for acids and bases. Okay. The problem with that definition is it is very, very narrow. 
right? So future chemists came along and said, could we expand this? Because I can still neutralize an acid without adding a substance that has hydroxide. Right? So we wanted to expand the definition outwards and make it a little bit more useful. So the Arrhenius definition, in my opinion, ends up being pretty useless because it's too narrow. So this is where we get Bronsted and Lowry. And so what they went through and did is focused in on one aspect of that neutralization reaction. And their aspect was looking at the hydrogen ion. They noticed that the hydrogen ion was common for all neutralization reactions. Every single one. So they kept the definition for our acid. Okay? It is a species that will somehow donate hydrogen ion. Okay? So in the process of it reacting, it gives up that hydrogen ion to whatever it's reacting with. The base did not have to have hydroxide, though. So we can't use the Arrhenius definition anymore. But in all cases, what did the base have to do? What is the acid getting rid of? A hydrogen ion. What must the base do for the acid to get rid of the hydrogen ion? It has to absorb it. So our Bronsted-Lowry definition is a proton acceptor or a hydrogen acceptor. Okay? You'll notice that I did oscillate a little bit in the terms used here. Our hydrogen ion donor is our standard for our acid. What would be my symbol for a hydrogen ion? H, good start. H2, is H2 an ion? No, okay. that's now a molecule in its elemental state, phenomenal. That's not a hydrogen ion. Faye suggested another option, it should be H plus, okay. As H+, plus, it is now an ion. How did it become H+. Plus? How do I go from a hydrogen atom to a hydrogen ion? What changed? A hydrogen atom has one electron. That's why it has no charge. So to do that, it had to lose an electron. Okay? Don't stress on the how. That's not super relevant. Okay? But ultimately what happens is our hydrogen ion is this H+. Plus. It has no electrons. Okay. Well, what does H+, plus have? Does it have any more electrons? How many electrons did hydrogen have? One. If it lost that one electron, how many electrons would the hydrogen ion have? It would have zero electrons. How many neutrons does it have? Do so I've got a suggestion for one? Because it has one proton, so it makes a hydrogen. Okay, so let's push. It has one proton. And then you need a neutron to balance. We would need a neutron to balance. What's the point of a neutron? To stabilize. Right? Stabilize what? The atom. What charge? What is the point of a neutron? So the difference between a proton and electron. Nope. To hold what? Yeah. Hold the nucleus together. Yes. What's it holding together? Only one sinking thing. A proton. proton. A proton. Is there anything to hold together if there's one thing? Well, when it gets more electrons, proton is there? Any, it's holding together the nucleus. Are there electrons in the nucleus? No. 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 So I could care less about the electrons. The electrons have nothing to do with the neutrons. What is the point of the neutron? To hold together the nucleus. Yeah. What's in the nucleus? One proton. One proton. One proton. Yeah. What is there to hold together if there's only one thing? Right. Nothing. Do I need a neutron? No. no. And for those who are saying, but doesn't it have a neutron? What's the mass of a neutron? One. What's the mass of a proton? One. One. What would our total mass of our hydrogen ion be? Two. What is the mass of hydrogen? One point. Why is it one? It only has one proton. How many neutrons? Zero. Zero. There are no neutrons for a hydrogen ion. Okay. All of that atomic theory where we built out goes up to charges. It goes up to explain the balance of these things. 
That's why we talked about it. Okay? When do I see the existence of a neutron? After hydrogen. After hydrogen. Why? When I move from hydrogen to helium, what happens to the number of protons? It goes up to two. What do the protons do when they get near each other? They repel because they're the same charge. The whole point of the nucleus is to keep the protons all in the exact same space. If they're going to repel, I need something to hold them there. What do I add to hold them there? There's our neutrons. Kind of make sense? Okay. So, back to the subatomic level here. Describe to me the hydrogen ion. What do you see when we look at the subatomic level for a hydrogen ion? You would see what? Just a proton. It slipped out very quickly, but I did say it. Instead of calling a Bronsted-Lowry acid as a hydrogen ion donor, I also said it was a proton donor. Why would I call it a proton? What is a hydrogen ion? <coughs> Literally just a proton. So you will hear reference for our hydrogen or for our Bronsted-Lowry definition as both hydrogen ions or protons. Why would we hear protons more often than hydrogen ions? It's shorter. So you will typically hear the Bronsted-Lowry definition revolving around protons, not hydrogen ions. Okay? This does not mean we're doing nuclear chemistry. Protons are not coming into a nucleus and out of a nucleus. Okay? We're still talking about a hydrogen atom next to another atom. But I can name that hydrogen atom a proton because that's literally all it is. Make sense? Okay. Our base must be a hydrogen ion acceptor. All right, well, let's go through and look at it. What was our standard base for Arrhenius? Hydroxide. So there we go, hydroxide. OH minus. Right? Is that a stable molecule? No, why not? It has extra electrons. It would be charged. What would I need to stabilize that negative charge? I would need, be less specific, a positive charge. What does the hydrogen ion supply? A positive charge. What we're talking about doing is neutralizing the charges. That's it. In the Bronsted-Lowry definition, we're talking about how we neutralize the charge on a hydrogen ion with some other species. Hydroxide's the easiest one to reference, but I could move to another species. I could do NH2 minus. Would I expect NH2 minus to act as a hydrogen ion acceptor? Yes. Why? Because it has a negative charge. It has a negative charge. What do I need to stabilize the positive? A negative. It aligns. Um, or NH2 minus doesn't fit the Arrhenius definition because it's not hydroxide. Okay. It will fit our Bronsted Lowry definition because that molecule will accept the hydrogen from our acid. Just the alignment of those charges. Okay. That makes the Bronsted-Lowry definition a lot more useful and also much more widely accepted. All right? So let's take a look at some examples. We're going to simplify it and just look at the top one. I want to be able to predict the product. All right, so right now, I have reactants. Why do I think these might be reactants? We see an arrow, right? And if we have that arrow, reactants are on the left-hand side of the arrow. Is that arrow a normal arrow? No. no, that looks weird. We'll deal with that later. So with this giant blank space, what might I be predicted to provide? Well, the products. Okay. How do I predict those products? I could try and go back to those reactants and categorize them 
according to the definitions that we've talked about back in units or unit two with chapter seven. You'll find these structures don't match that unit very well because they're charged. Right? So we want to use what we know about our chemistry and our definitions to apply how this could react. What makes that first molecule reactive? The minus two. That negative two charge, right? What species are negative? Sulfur. Fair enough, electrons. Uh, what species that we literally just talked about on the previous slide are negative? Bases. For that species to act as a base, what does it need to do? It must accept a hydrogen, right? How many hydrogens are we going to have it accept? We have the option for one or two. We could do two to balance everything out. Because we're trying to keep these things as simple and cut and dry as possible, we're only going to do one. Right? What would I produce if that species accepted a hydrogen? I would have a hydrogen. And then SO3. Okay, and let's take a moment here to pause. We got one person going hydrogen or H and then SO3. And then we got other people trying to say hydrogen, sulf. Yeah. So, okay, good. Let's address a couple things there. Number one, that's a hard thing to name. If you can't name it, throw out all the letters and numbers in the correct order and run with that. Okay, that's absolutely a fair game. So H, SO3 is fine. Name would be hydrogen, Sulfite. Three oxygens is the ite. Four oxygens would have been the eight. Mm -hmm. okay. What would the charge be? Well, I can address that in a second, too. You said negative charge. Why is it a negative charge? We started at a negative two. We accepted one positive which means one of the negatives has been canceled out, the positive is now canceled out, and we'd be left with a remaining negative one charge. Make sense? Yes. Cool. Okay. There was a reference for calling this sulfurous acid. Okay. To get the acid moniker, what would we need to see? Aqueous. Aqueous isn't specified here. Why not? Because I hate specifying phases. Okay? And it's not relevant to this question. Okay? So don't stress about that. If we saw the aqueous, you'd be better off. Though even then it becomes problematic because it's still an ion. We can't call it sulfurous acid. Okay? So where did it get that hydrogen from? It would have to come from the other compound in the reaction. What makes that other compound reactive? That positive. What species were positive according to our last slide? Acids. Interesting, we have a base mixed with an acid, we'd be running a neutralization reaction. If it acts as an acid, what would it do? It would donate a hydrogen. Okay? We could also write lose hydrogen. How many hydrogens do I want to lose? One. What would my formula look like? H2, because I lost one hydrogen. Oh, what's the charge? The hydrogen I lost was positive. I started positive. I lost a positive, so I become neutral. We have to pass through neutrality before we can become negative. We've now predicted our products. All we did was look at the charges and align them with our definitions of acids and bases.
Yeah? Right? We could have taken this a step further and said this as an acid needs to donate a hydrogen. In the process, it would become H2O. What is it going to donate that hydrogen to? The sulfite ion, so that must be HSO3 minus. I didn't actually have to address that that was acting as a base right out of the gate. Does that make sense? Okay. Questions? Okay, I'm going to erase some stuff. Uh, quick question. Because it's an acid and a base together, it has to be a neutralization so that one of the products has to be water. Correct? So, yes and no. Um, according to our Arrhenius definition, yes, we should be do, producing water. According to the strictest sense of the definition that we told you to memorize back in Chapter 7, yes, it should be do, producing water. Does a neutralization have to produce water? No. Okay. The neutralization has to neutralize the reactivity of the acid in the base. So what it will end up with is an ionic species and a neutral species. According to the strictest definition of a neutralization, the neutral species is water. It doesn't have to be water. It could be any neutral species. Right? But the product of a neutralization is officially a salt, some kind of ionic compound, and a neutral species, not necessarily water. Okay. What we addressed in this was the reaction running from left to right. So there's that arrow, right? But if you notice, there's another arrow. If we look at that other arrow, what would that make this side of the equation? Reactants. The reaction can run in reverse. Okay. So let's look at that in reverse. For HSO3 minus, okay, and this is where it's going to get interesting, what could it act as? Why do you say base? Because it's negatively charged and it's trying to accept hydrogen. Negatively charged, it could absolutely accept a hydrogen. And I completely agree with that. Okay? But I'm going to be a little bit obnoxious and perhaps give something away. What happens if it acts as a base? What does it need to do? What do bases need to do? Accept a hydrogen. If it accepted a hydrogen, what would it become? Would your equation be valid? No. Okay. If we look at what happens in our actual expression, that species could act as a base. It could also act as an acid. That molecule happens to be a particularly interesting one. It is what is known as amphoteric, meaning it can act as both acid and base. Ambidextrous. You have the ability for left and right usage, right? Amphoteric or amphiprotic are referencing the ability to go both directions, act as either acids or bases. How would we know which one we should be doing? Figure out where it came from, what it did to get there. We need to figure out what, or what it's reacting with. We could look at what it's reacting with. Water is going to be problematic because water could be amphoteric. How do we know that HSO3 minus should be acting as an acid and not as a base in this case? <laughs> we know what it has to turn into. What you're doing is comparing the most similar objects across the equation and deciding how they changed. SO, HSO3 minus had to become SO3 minus 2 because of this equation, okay? which means HSO3 minus, in this case, must act as an acid. 
While it has the ability to act as a base, it is not acting as a base in this circumstance. Okay? For lack of a better analogy, a marine runs around, well, horribly, I'm going to butcher the hell out of this. Oh, well. A marine runs around and kills people, right? In war. When they come home, they don't do that. They have the ability to do both. Depending on where they're located, the context will change. So we have to look at contextual clues within our equation to help predict that. Does that make sense? Okay. Sorry, that was all I could come up with. That's why you should come up with examples before you talk about it. So how, that's an interesting question. What you'd be looking at is the balance between those asses and bases. So I could ask, just straight up, what could HSO3 minus do? Is it an acid? Is it a base? Is it neither? Is it both? It's both. It can do both. Okay. I could ask, what is HSO3 minus doing in this case? Is it an acid? Is it a base? Is it neither? Is it both? It's an acid. Okay. So if you're left open-ended, all things are open. Are, are possible. If you're left with some contextual clues, now you close out options. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. It acted as an acid by donating a hydrogen. Donating a hydrogen to what? To the water molecule, which means the water molecule has to gain a hydrogen. In the process of gaining a hydrogen, it would become H3O+. What did it act as? A base. Yeah? Cool. So let's throw in a new test question. Which species is the base? Which species is the base? I can, I can, we can even make multiple choice answers. A, B, C, D, or E, none of the above. Or F, A, and B. Okay, that's a very tricky question because our language at this point doesn't allow us to refine the difference between the base A and the base D, which means if our language isn't good enough, what do we do? We make new language. Okay. We need a new language to be able to differentiate that. Okay. Or the answer becomes A and D. What is that new language? Lower right hand corner. Conjugate partners. We're going to be referencing conjugates. Okay. Where those conjugates are becomes challenging. The red arrows are connecting conjugate partners. The blue arrows are connecting conjugate partners. Okay. If I'm asking for the base, and this is kind of an interesting nuance, the base I am by default referencing as a reactant. Where's the reactant? Damn it, on both sides of the equation. But how do we read? Left to right, which means our priority is left, which means our reactant is left. left. So if I ask for the base, the answer is A. A. What if I want you to answer D? What do I have to ask? Base. Which species is the conjugate base? Now it allows me to reference that species. Make sense? Okay. That helps to clarify all of the potential labels that could go through it and allows us to better speak about that reaction. Okay. I think I've got like a million steps here. Yep. Okay. So let's push that double arrow a little bit. That double arrow is an equilibrium arrow. 
And what that's referencing is reversible reactions. A reaction can go forward just as well as it can go in reverse. When you put on your shirt, could your shirt also come off? Oh, yeah. Yes, it can. That was said a little more sultrily than I would have liked, but yes. Okay? Yes, it can come off. Both of those things are possible. When we're looking at chemical reactions. True. <laughs> we can just keep digging with that one. Okay. What we're looking at is a reversibility. Chemical reactions have a reversibility. Right? Are they all equally reversible? Right? Man, um, this is, uh, we're just digging out there. So let's going to deal with it. Okay, let's, we're running with the shirt and the socks. Okay, shirt and the socks. Both of those I could put on and I could put them on, right? And are they going to come on and off with the same frequency? Probably. I'm going to take off this shirt, and as soon as I take off this shirt, I'm also going to take off my socks. If I was hopping in the shower, it might be true. But if I just go home and I chill at home, I'll probably take off the shirt. Do the socks necessarily have to come off? They might. They might. They might not. So that's a challenging one. How about the wedding ring? Yes. Should that come off with the same frequency that my shirt and socks do? What? It depends on if you're cheating. And you can again run the depends argument, but if you still run on the absolute scale, the ring is not going to come off as frequently as the shirt and socks. <laughs> <laughs> right? Do you at least catch the analogy? Just walk over here. <laughs> so, the next part is that that reversibility in chemical reactions will achieve a balance. Eventually, all reactions will reach a point where the forward rate and the reverse rate match each other. Right? That doesn't work very well for clothes because they're either on or they're off. We don't really get kind of this reverse system as cleanly seen because the time delay is so long. Chemical reactions are insanely fast so they can achieve that balance and we can monitor that. Okay? Le Chatelier went through and said that once a reaction achieves that equilibrium, that balance, it's going to do everything it can to stay balanced. Okay. How did he discover that? Well, he took a reaction that was balanced. Okay. So if you saw like a brother or a friend, sister that were trying to balance on a balance beam and they were balanced, what might you do as the older or younger sibling? Kick them. Right? You messed with them. Le Chatelier did effectively the same thing. Took a reaction that was balanced and kicked it to see what would happen. Okay. And what did he notice happened? What happened to your brother, sibling, sister, friend? They fell. <laughs> Before they fall, they, got they, falling. they might try and catch their balance. And what happens? They go back and forwards to regain that balance. Once they've achieved that balance, the next time you have to kick harder so they actually fall off. Okay? But they're still attaining that balance, going left and right. Left and right, kind of like the left and right of reactants and products. Wow. Okay? And that's the same kind of concept that's happening with equilibrium. Okay? Couple real world comparisons, sort of, that we can use is a seesaw, okay? which hardly anybody knows anything about because seesaws are dangerous and death traps. Okay? But let's go ahead and just walk through it. We take a board and we take a fulcrum. Okay? If it was a normal seesaw, that fulcrum goes where? In the middle. In the middle okay? Which then allows you to do what? Okay? You could put a kid on one end. You could put a kid on the other end. And then yaga. And then you can bounce back and forth, right? 
Okay, and you're getting that bouncing up and down. Okay, well, let's pull this or push this to chemistry. If I go through and look at the seesaw, it wants to obtain that balance, that flat level. So when I start my reaction, how much reactants would I have? A lot or a little? When I start a reaction, how much reactants would I have? I would have a lot. Okay, because you're starting a reaction. What do you start a reaction with? Products? Do you start this class with a letter grade? No. Okay, you start with all of the projects that get you to that letter grade. We start with a lot of reactants. Would this seesaw be in balance? No, right? This would very quickly teeter that direction, right? Okay. Chemistry wants to achieve that balance. So what does the chemical reaction have to do to balance? Make an equal amount of products. We have to make an equal amount of products. So could I just draw another box roughly the same size on the other side? Okay. Where did those products come from? The reactants, which means I can't just throw an equal size box of products on the other side. What am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to delete some of that reactant so that it can become product. Now they're balanced. Now that we've achieved the equilibrium, Le Chatelier comes through and kicks it. Okay? We don't just kick the seesaw because all that's going to happen is allow it to just rebalance out. Okay? So we really want to mess with this. So what he goes through and does is says, okay, well, you've achieved that equilibrium. That's nice. I'm going to give you more reactant. Is it in balance? So what does it do to achieve that balance? It deletes, itself to make more. it deletes some reactant to make more product. We're now at that equilibrium again. Okay. Is there something else we could have done? What's that? Move the reactant to the middle. We'll address motion of stuff in a second, but no. Okay. What else could we do to this equilibrium? Because this equilibrium is now defined by that fulcrum. I could change the products. Instead of adding reactants, let's add products. What happens when I add more products? Am I in balance? Yes. yes. No. So what happens? We're going to take some of that product away. We're going to reverse the reaction to make reactants. more reactants. Okay. That's ultimately what Le Chatelier was discovering between this. And what he could identify for any chemical reaction, that equilibrium was constant. Didn't matter how much reactant or product we put in there, we always achieved the same ratio of products to reactants that ratio he decided to define as equilibrium. So for this particular example, we're looking at the ratio of products to reactants. And what ratio do you think we would get? This would be a one to one. Would this be a good reaction? If you're a chemist, your goal is to make something, right? Is that a good reaction to do? Why not? I started with two molecules of reactant. One of them became a product. The other one did nothing. I'm getting at best a 50% yield. So that as a reaction is a horrible reaction, okay, or not a useful one. Okay, so as a chemist, I want a reaction that gets more product when I put in the reactants. So what might change about my ratio? What do I want that ratio to be? To be, yes, that's my ideal reaction. More product. More product, less reactant. What's the ratio? Okay. More over less. Infinity. Fine. Two works. Okay. Really what we're looking for is large numbers. Okay. So let's say we went up to 1,000. How do we get that ratio to manifest in the seesaw? Every 
I would need a ton of product and a very small amount of reactant, right? Would that be in balance? How do I make it in balance? Move the equilibrium. The equilibrium is a constant for any individual reaction. We just went through and said we wanted this result. How do we manifest that in our diagram? That means the fulcrum that's dictating the whole process needs to be way over there. That now allows for that balance. So when we're talking about equilibrium, it does not say the reactants and products are equal to each other. Right? Because this achieves that balance, and they're certainly not equal to each other. The equilibrium is where that balance is. Does it favor products or does it favor reactants? That's it. Kind of make sense? Yes. For the record, that was one of the better seesaw examples that has ever come out in teaching this. So good job, guys. Yes. Okay. So let's take a look at another analogy, two divided chambers. Okay. And we'll divide it a little bit further. Okay, so here's my full-on division. Okay, we've got a left chamber and a right chamber, kind of like how we have. Exactly, reactants and products. <laughs> Were you saying left and right heart chambers? Is that what I heard? No. <laughs> left and right hands, that works too. Okay, when I start a reaction, what do I start with? Reactants. Okay. So I'm going to represent the amount of substance as a liquid. So I'm going to pour liquid into the reactant chamber. How much reactants do I have? All of it. I'll accept that, all of it. Okay. <laughs> They're all reactants. Would I ever expect product to form in this reaction? No. Why not? Because you're a close divider. There's a wall. The liquid literally can't transfer across the other side. Okay. But now what we're going to do is say, OK, since I've got my reactants all there, I'm arbitrarily saying they can't react. But now I'll say, OK, now you can react. In this analogy, what I'm going to do to react it is remove the barrier at the bottom. What happens? It will level out. So that the liquid's the same across, right? Okay. Once I've achieved that, and this is where this analogy is better, does that mean reactant stops forming product? Okay. Remember, it's a liquid. Yeah. What happens to the liquid? Does it only stay on the left-hand side of the chamber? No. no, it moves back and forth. The rate going forwards equals the rate going backwards. That's what drives our equilibrium. Okay? It is sometimes referred to a dynamic equilibrium because it is still constantly changing, but it's oscillating back and forth, staying at whatever that equilibrium value is. The liquid levels in each of those chambers stays the same. Okay? So Le Chatelier comes through and wants to mess with this. To mess with this, what could he do? I don't accept tipping it. What could we do? Let's add some product. So we're going to close the chamber. We're going to add some more product. Now what happens when I open the chamber? It's going to level out again. Okay. If we look at how we started our first equilibrium, we have a smaller volume here than we end with, right? Everybody see that? So that must mean that the equilibrium changed, right? No. What is the equilibrium? What was the equilibrium? We already defined it. It's the ratio of products to reactants. When we started off with our red, the ratio of red to red here was 1. When I add more product, the level goes up. The absolute value of those reactants and products has changed, but what happened to the ratio? It didn't change. It stays the same. That's the point of equilibrium. 
right? which is kind of neat. There are all sorts of extra kind of secondary rules that stack within this, and I did ask some questions in the RWS to really push you to look at those. The textbook is going to provide you some rules to add layers on top of this. Okay? This is pretty core to what you need for equilibrium. Okay? How complicated is this topic? I said we talk about it in 152, second semester general chemistry. Second semester general chemistry is 16 weeks. About 12 of them are devoted to equilibrium. At most for us, on any individual topic, we've spent two weeks. Okay? You spend 12 weeks discussing equilibrium in 152. It is an exceptionally concept or complex topic, and the mathematics that can go behind it are a lot more detailed and involved. Okay? What are those mathematics involving? You know all the conversions that we've been doing with molarity and moles and all? Yeah. Okay? And it doubles down. No quantum. Okay? Just like with the seesaw, we could move the fulcrum. How could we move this so that our reactants and products don't have to come out to a ratio of one? Move the wall. When I now fill my reactants in, and I remove the barrier at the bottom, it will level out, but the amount of products and reactants will have changed. Would this be a good example of a reaction that I want to run as a chemist? No, why not? I got hardly any products out of this. I got a ton of reactants. This was a reaction that effectively did nothing. Okay. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? If you're trying to make something, that's a bad thing. Okay. But if you're trying to study something, that might actually be useful depending on what you're looking at. Okay. That's where 152 comes in. I'll leave it to you to go do that in a year and a half okay. or a year. Okay. So what affects the rates? Remember we said the rate of the forward equals the rate of the reverse. What's going to affect how those things react? Okay. It's helpful to throw in a couple things here. So A plus B goes to C plus D and vice versa. What's going to affect how fast that red reaction occurs? What's that? Phase, okay? If A is a solid and B is a gas, where's the gas? Yeah. Everywhere. Where's the solid? One tiny little spot. For them to react, what must happen? They have to collide. They have to interact. So the phase of your reactants, okay, matters a lot, right? Could I increase the odds of that solid interacting with the gas? Yes. Okay. We've got a really simple example. Has anybody started a fire before? Yes. Yeah. When you start that fire, do you take a log and just put a match to it? No. Why not? You should use a drone player. You need a bigger match. Or a smaller log. Or a smaller log. <laughs> Most people shift to the smaller log. When we go through to light and start a campfire, we use kindling. We use smaller pieces of wood. Why don't we use just the big piece? What is different about the smaller piece than the larger piece? Surface area. Okay. So if I can break up that large piece into lots of tiny pieces, I can increase the frequency at which the gas can interact with the solid. Right. That's going to change the speed of the reaction. Right? Because we're running a little bit shorter on time, we can push it just straight into the awkward point. If you're trying to find a future significant other, right, what is going to affect your ability to become partnered? If there's more to choose from. Thank you. If there's more to choose from. If you are the only person on the planet, are you ever going to find a significant other? No. no. <laughs> okay? Because there's nobody else there. So you need concentrations of both. We need an amount of both those partners. 
So concentration plays a huge role. What are the units on concentration? Molarity. molarity. What are the units on molarity? molarity. Moles over liters. Moles is the amount. Right? You're no longer the only person on the planet. But you are only allowed to be in this room. Everybody else is allowed everywhere else. The local concentration of people around you is zero, which means no interactions, no significant partners. Okay? So concentration plays a large role, which considers not only the amount of the substance, but also the volume that you're allowed to occupy. What could speed that interaction along? A door. A door? <laughs> the internet? Common friends? Being like, hey, I know this person. You should date them. Because that works out so well. Right? But that thing is acting as a catalyst to speed the reaction. So we could add catalysts to speed these reactions. So what we're trying to consider on the chemical level is the same stuff that you would try and consider on trying to find a significant other. Okay? All to different levels. We brought in the option of attractiveness. I think there was another one. The same thing applies to chemistry. That one gets a little bit odd. That would be our nature of the reactant, arguably. Okay. The mechanism, how does the reaction proceed? If you only talk to people's backsides, what are the odds of finding a significant partner? I don't know about that. Never. Okay. That's not going to work so well. Okay. How you're interacting with the world makes a really big difference. Okay. Temperature. Okay. If we freeze the room, what are the odds of you interacting with anybody? It decreases. Why? Why would it decrease? If you freeze, uh, don't do that. What happens to your ability to move if we freeze the room? You can't, which means your volume, okay, in comparison to everything else, is now drastically changed. Your local concentration, because you can't move, goes to zero. Right? Catalyst. So these are all the things that would contribute to a rate for the reaction. Do they affect the equilibrium? Of course not. What was the equilibrium? Always one to one. No, it was absolutely not always one to one. It's reversed, or you can reverse it or something. The rate or the equilibrium was when the rate of the forward Match the rate of the reverse. All of these things do what? Change the rate. Okay. You're still going to achieve an equilibrium. Okay. The equilibrium for that given reaction will always be the same. That's neat. Okay. We can look at it with acids. Okay. Strong acids. Okay, produce lots of H+. Weak acids don't produce a lot of H+. So if we go through and take a look at HCl, was anybody ever told to watch out for hydrochloric acid? Why were you told to watch out? Because it'll melt your face, because it's producing H+, and Cl-. Meaning when I take HCl, all of it becomes H+. That's really dangerous. What would my equilibrium be? My products over reactants. When I take HCl, all of it becomes H+. Wait, what? You take HCl, it becomes H+. Say that again? All enough. Okay. If I start with, say, 50 HCl, and all of it goes to H+, what's my product concentration? 50, right? Because they all transferred across. What's my concentration of HCl? How much HCl is left? One. Well, one. Or zero. It's a limit, okay? It's as close to zero as we can humanly get. 
which means we're taking 50 and we're dividing by an infinitely small number. What's the end result? It's an infinitely large number. So for HCl, we're getting tons of products. Our equilibrium value is massive. Okay. What happens for something like acetic acid? How many of you were told to watch out and don't touch the vinegar? Okay. Why is that different? If we take a look at acetic acid, the formula is down there, what happens? We get H plus, wait, isn't, isn't that what hydrochloric acid gave you? Yeah, it did. So I'm still getting H plus, the melt my face off death. And yet this time, I'm not told to worry about it. Why? Concentration of what? The H plus isn't as high a concentration. When I look at its product to reactant ratio, what am I going to see? A much smaller number than the infinitely large one for the HCl. Because the product concentration is going to be lower, and my reactant concentration will therefore be higher. Okay, so if we did that same 50 option, whoops. We could do something on the order of this. At some point, that balance between reactants and products hits a threshold where we decide, holy crap, that's dangerous, don't touch it, and meh, go ahead and drink it on your salad. Okay? On your pickles. Okay? That threshold is an interesting line. How do we decide what that threshold is? Well, there's a couple things we could do. We could go through and just tell people to memorize these really dangerous ones. Is HCl dangerous? Yes. Yeah, go figure. It makes the really dangerous list. Okay. These strong acids, HClO3, uh, that one, H2SO4, HI, HBr, there it is, HCl, HNO3. Those are defined as our strong acids. Did you see HC2, H3O2, the acetic no. acid? No, it's not on there because it's a weak acid. So if you memorize the strong acids, anything that's not strong then becomes weak, and that's going to change how we'll interact with it. Make sense? Bases have a similar process. Bases. The strong bases all have hydroxide. Okay? The hydroxide needs to be ionizable. It must dissolve. Group 1A and 2A cations bound to hydroxide are defined as strong bases. <clears throat> what if it's not one of those? It's weak. That establishes, whoops, come back here, are everything else. Doesn't there need to be a charge on this? No. <clears throat> Just like the acids, it doesn't have to be charged. The example I picked was to clarify it a little bit, okay? So the weak acids, those ionize to varying extents, meaning there's an equilibrium. Some goes to reactants or products, a lot goes back to the reactants. That means you study weak acids and bases in 152 when we talk about equilibrium. The strong acids and bases ionize entirely, so they're very easy to interpret. You see those in 151 and... 130, this class, all of the acids we dealt with were strong ionizers. We didn't work with any weak acids and bases because the weak acids and bases require a lot more calculations behind them, and you didn't like the calculations we already did. Right? Okay. So if you need 152, that's when the calculations will skyrocket, and you get a lot more math stuff coming in. Okay. Perchloric acid. Per perchloric. Per oh, so let's walk through that. Okay, we are defining that as an acid right there, even though it doesn't have a Q written next to it. Again, I don't like phases, but I labeled it as an acid, so deal with it. Okay, is that a binary acid or a ternary acid? Ternary. How do you know it's ternary? There's more than two elements, so it's got to be ternary. In the ternary acid, do we use the prefix hydro? No. 
So the hydrogen placement in a ternary acid really only comes out because we see the word acid in our name. The rest of that name is due to the complex ion. What is the name of that complex ion? Perchlorate. Okay. That's just the name of the complex ion. When I put that complex ion next to a hydrogen, it now becomes an acid, and I have to change that ending. And because I ate too much, I got a bit sick, fat, <laughs> Jesus. And I get perchloric acid. <laughs> Back to the safety aspects are strong acids. We could just tell people to memorize those. The weak acids we could worry less about. Okay? But if you go out and drink glacial acetic acid, it's going to kill you. Okay? What is the difference between glacial acetic acid and vinegar? Concentration. Vinegar is 5% acetic acid. Glacial acetic acid is 100% acetic acid. So the concentration of that species makes a really big difference. Because even though it's producing a small amount of H plus per individual molecule, if there's a lot of the molecules, that's still a lot of H plus. Okay? So when we think about our acids and bases, we needed another system to help understand this. We could go based off of concentrations. How many of you heard concentration before the class? Okay. Some people are like, yeah, kinda. Did you know anything about what it meant and the application of that? That's when things start to become gray. So if I told someone, watch out for that 0.15 we can ignore molar. Let's just say concentration H plus solution. And you're like, what the hell are you talking about? Right? That doesn't make any sense. Right? So we need another way to interpret that molarity. Right? Particularly because in that case, that molarity happens to be a decimal. And we all do awesome with decimals. Oh, yeah. right? So we want to come up with a system to convert that into another rating system okay we could have used pinch was it peach and orange and lime and fire engine red what is our safety thing in our airports yeah nobody knows right you've got levels of threat right in the airports sure if you say so there we go yeah good work faa they picked a color system that didn't work so we want a different system that allows people to understand better. What system do people know better? Red, yellow, green. Counting. Numbers. What numbers do we understand better, though? One through ten. We have to keep it relatively simple. Okay? <laughs> I just need to walk away. <laughs> So what we invented was something known as the pH. Have you heard of pH before? Yeah. All pH is is another way to represent concentration of acid. That's it. That's the whole point of it. What is the pH scale? 1 to 14. Not perfect, but for the most part, we covered our 1 to 10 goal. How did we convert those weird concentration decimal values into a 1 to 14 scale? We ran a mathematical formula. pH is defined as the negative log of the concentration of hydrogen ion. So we take 0.15, and I take the negative log of 0.15. I now have the pH of that solution. I've converted that 0.15 into a 1 through 14 number that allows me to give a ballpark estimate on something about safety. Low and, P and high pHs are bad, so we do have to do some literacy for training, but for the most part, it's pretty simple. What's our neutral pH? Seven. Seven, halfway in between. Anything low and high are bad. Low pH means? It's 
It's bad. Is it acidic or basic? It's acidic. And a, a high pH would be basic. It's just a way for us to be able to interpret that information and using a relatively simple numerical value, draw some quick conclusions and ballpark it. Okay? That, in combination with equilibrium, can explode the amount of calculations that can be done with that, and it makes it very challenging to deal with. Okay? 152. If you go through and run the textbook questions, you can get lots of questions with pH and negative log. I want you to be familiar with the scale, and that's about it. Okay? Do these now have a different definition of acid and base? Nope. These are still the same definition of acid and base. An acid, a low pH is an acid. There's a high concentration of hydrogen ions. When we go to a base, we have a high concentration of hydroxide. Okay. Exciting thing about this slide, we'll find out here in a second. Electrolytes are anything that, add, that you can add to water and that they ionize. Okay. So sodium chloride is an electrolyte. Because when I add it to water, what does it do? It ionizes into sodium ion and chloride ion. How much does it ionize? All of it. How do we know that all of it ionizes? So we can say from experience. That is a valid answer. But of course in this class, it's an unacceptable answer. Another ionic compound, silver chloride, silver ion, chloride ion. How much of this ionizes? Remember, if we're talking about this actually balancing out, this is still holding our concept of equilibrium. It wasn't nicely drawn. This is an equilibrium reaction. It goes backwards and forwards. How much of this ionizes? Said another way, there should be an arrow drawn between these. Should that arrow be aimed towards the right? Should it be aimed towards the left? Should it be both? And for those of you going, dang, we never talked about this. Yes, we did. How would we decide? We're talking about the ability for something to dissolve. Dissolve in what? Water. We might refer to that as what? Solubility. But this is an ionic compound, so this doesn't match the solubility of intermolecular forces we talked about. Where else did we talk about solubility? Lab. Lab? Which lab? Uh, Shouting out numbers doesn't count because I don't know the numbers. <laughs> we could try the electrolyte lab, except the electrolyte lab didn't actually tell us which way the arrows went, particularly for this compound. How would we know for this compound? We would have to know something about the solubility of silver chloride. Do the what? Solubility series tests. I can sort of accept that. The box of the boxes. Yeah, there were some boxes that explained something about solubility that we referenced as the solubility rules. Those solubility rules, when we go to look this up, would tell us that silver chloride is insoluble, which means what arrow should I see here? It should go to the left. It does not ionize. Okay. So that compound is a non-electrolyte because it doesn't make ions. Sodium chloride is an electrolyte because it does make ions. Okay, so we could go through and look at a variety of examples. We've got the salt, sodium chloride. We've got H2SO4. If we're really going to nitpick that, we could also drop in the AQ on that. What can you tell me about H2SO4 AQ? You should be able to tell me a bit more. 
Fair enough. Keep going. <laughs> what can you tell me about it being a strong acid? It completely ionizes. If it completely ionizes, what happens to the ion concentration? It goes up, which makes it a or an electrolyte. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base, and it is therefore an electrolyte. Calcium carbonate, silver bromide, iron oxide, or hydroxide. How would we know if they dissolved in water? We would have to look at our solubility rules. And when we look up the solubility rules, we would find for all three of those that they are all insoluble, which means low to non-electrolytes because there's no ions. Last three. Okay, I appreciate that. Why do you say that? There's a lot of carbons and hydrogens and oxygen. What can you tell me is common of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? Uh, I don't accept soluble. Wait, say the question again. What can you tell me about carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? They have something in common. They are all non-metals. Do we have ions in non-polar covalent compounds? No, which means they're non-electrolytes. Okay. This is why understanding and knowing the definitions of those things can help you. We just answered that by going all the way back to unit one and saying they're to the right of the staircase. Wow. Okay. I do want to throw in one more here. Take a look at this guy. What do we see here? It's an acid. Why? The H in front. But if it's an acid, doesn't it ionize? Does it completely ionize? H2SO4 was all nonmetals, yet that one was an electrolyte. Why was that one an electrolyte but not this one? It was a strong acid. So knowing our strong acids can help us differentiate that. Take a look at the last one. What do you see? You see hydroxide. Does anybody want to agree? Yep. No, there's no hydroxide in this compound. There is an OH. There is no hydroxide. For there to be hydroxide, we must have a negative oxygen. How do we get the negative oxygen? The oxygen would have had to take an electron from what? A metal. A metal to the left of the staircase. Sodium hydroxide is a hydroxide. Because the oxygen is bound to a metal, that is ionic, that gets me hydroxide. Is this oxygen connected to a metal? No, no which means not hydroxide. Which means it is a non-electrolyte and it is not our base definition. Because that is not hydroxide. Okay. That is insanely cool, and believe it or not, that concept that we just talked about with that compound, organic chemistry students screw up all the time because people go through and memorize OH is hydroxide. OH is not hydroxide. OH bonded to a metal is hydroxide. Okay? So you have to be careful with your definitions. Why might I have said this slide was the best slide of the entire semester?